All right, well, we'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few others join us, but in the meantime, um, I wanted to introduce myself to those of you that may not know me. I'm Ryan King, the communications manager here at CureJM in the past six months or so, and I'm a parent of a child with JM, Sturgill King. He's a seven-year-old. So um, this topic of sun protection is, is near and dear to most of us, and I think we all need daily reminders. Um, especially for our teens and, and little ones um, on how important it is. Um, so I'm really excited about this topic today. Um, you know, we're into June now. There, there's so much going on in the summertime. Um, hopefully we'll have potentially some uh, teens that are out of school join us. Um, but speaking of summer, I wanted to kick off with some housekeeping for the summer. As uh, most of you know, we're now within uh, under a month to the family conference. So there still is a little bit of time, a very limited amount of time for anyone interested in, in joining. Um, spaces are filling up and the hotel block is likely to be capped by June 7th, which is next week. So if there was ever a time that you thought you might be able to make the, the trek to, to DC, um, now would be the, the time to act. Um, so if you have any questions, please reach out to myself, Betsy or, or Shannon but we do still have um, some limited availability, but again, that probably will be closing out here very shortly. Um, and then speaking of other exciting things going on in the month of June and the summer, we are right in the middle of walk season. Our, uh, our Walk Strong events uh, kicked off about a month ago. We have our big um, state New York walk tomorrow, actually in New York City um, or New York State Walk. And it's very exciting to announce that we are currently at 48% of our fundraising goal of 650,000. Uh, we went over the 300,000 mark yesterday as of June 1st. So very, very exciting stuff. Thank you all who are walking and fundraising and you know sharing um, across the country. It's, it's definitely something that we can unite over um, for our kids and, and patients. Uh, we have over 42 states represented currently, so it's uh, exciting times, and um, I don't see any reason that if we have a great weekend and everyone shares their, their pages, that we couldn't uh, go over that 50% mark over the weekend. Um, so I wanted to pass it off to, to Shannon quickly to follow up on the importance of the walk. Yeah, great. Well, um, I'll keep it short because I know we really want to hear about sun. Um, I'm a parent of a teenager who despises sunblock and doesn't want to wear a hat. So this is a, a topic near and dear um, to my heart. So um, when we were diagnosed, um, gosh, it's been about 15 years. Um, our doctor, Rui Carrasco, who I'm sure most of you know, uh, invited us to get involved with CureJM because he had a patient that was involved. And being part of the research and the solution was really meaningful for our family um, at during a difficult time, right? Um, so now I support CureJM and helping other families get involved. So um, I'd love to chat anytime. And I'm going to open some breakout rooms at the end of this great session so that anyone who wants to stay um, and chat with other families or other teens and young adults can do so. So we would love to have everyone stay and chat about how you can get involved or meet other families. Um, and we'll be sending some information out after if anyone wants to participate um, in the walk. The funds raised go to support uh, the incredible research being done, including that at Cincinnati Children's um, under the leadership of Dr. Anjali Svan and others. So it's, um, it's really important. So I know, um, we're all here. We want to hear about sun and, and why it matters. And on it, and I think we, you know, um, myself included, still find it a little bit confusing. So we'll probably all learn a lot today. Thanks so much, Shannon. Well, with that being said, I'd like to in introduce kind of uh, our dynamic duo for, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, we are so fortunate to have here, let me remove Shannon. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Marathi and Dr. Angelise Hahn, again, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Marathi, um, who is a pillar in the JM support community, um, serving as a pediatric dermatologist and the division director at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. 
Um, she's accomplished in research and has uh, many academic uh, interests that include pediatric vulvar disease, atopic dermatosis, uh, genetic skin disorders, and more. Um, she completed a derm dermatology fellowship at Columbia University in New York. And um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Marathi, you guys in Cincinnati have the largest pediatric dermatology department in the nation, I believe. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet, but, but it's one of the largest. We're, gro we're growing, we're growing. Okay. We're trying, we, right now there's, uh, we have, we're just actually adding on another faculty this fall and we have uh, three faculty, two, three nurse practitioners. We have two fellowship slots. So um, we're growing, growing, growing. <laughs> awesome. And, and maybe I confuse that. Um, and, and speaking with Dr. Angelis, Rheum on, I believe. Rheumatology though, our pediatric rheumatology division is I think the largest in the country. It's uh, pretty impressive. <laughs> that, that's very cool. And it, it's kind of neat that you all work together to give that holistic approach to, uh, you know, each side of, of the disease. Um, and I'd like to also introduce Dr. Angelis Hahn. Again, she is a part of the division of rheumatology, the, the largest being Cincinnati <laughs> Children's Hospital. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to have her. She is uh, fresh off of travel, so we're, we're excited to have her back. And uh, she will be involved in the Q&A portion of this. Dr. Marathi will lead the presentation. And then per usual, we will, um, following the presentation, open it up to question and answers um, in which you can ask both Dr. Angelis Hahn and Dr. Marathi um, questions related to sun exposure and, and sun protection. Um, last housekeeping item before I hand it off to Dr. Marathi is um, for those interested, just like last time, we will um, engage in, in short breakout groups for parents, grandparents, um, patients, or teens, depending who all is on the call and available to stick around. Um, just a, a short time to connect and, and socialize. Um, so if you're interested in that, please stay on and then Shannon and myself will get you in the appropriate group. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Marathi for today's presentation on sun protection tips and tricks for the summer. All right, can everybody see my screen? Okay, yes. great. A um, couple of caveats. I am very excited to be here. I'm, it's very, it's so kind of you to ask me and I'm just so impressed with what your organization is doing and it's so meaningful. It's really meaningful work. So thank you for doing that. I have had a long interest in connective tissue diseases. And when I was at Children's National, before I came to Cincinnati, I did a joint clinic with a pediatric rheumatologist there, and we did that for five years while I was there, and it was really one of my favorite things in the world, and I love taking care of patients with these autoimmune conditions um, because I feel like we can really make a big impact in their lives. So <clears throat> this, this talk has a lot of information. <laughs> it turns out... so. <laughs> When I was asked to give this talk, I was like, well, I know about sun protection. I'm a dermatologist. It turns out I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And I got to learn actually a lot of new things. So that was really exciting. But I've shared these slides with Ryan. And so um, we can share those out with people minus the slides with the patient photos. Um, we can slide, we can share all of the in relevant information for you all so that you don't have to, you don't feel like you have to take notes or anything like that. So where I wanted to just give you some, I'm a dermatologist, so I can't not show you pictures of people's skin. That's like my favorite thing to do in the whole world. So I'm going to show you just some different features of dermatomyositis and how it can look in different skin tones, because I think that's really important. And then we're going to go through sun protection methods and my tips for you all. So when we talk about sun distribu distributed rashes, we sort of think of this malar butterfly rash. But a lot of times it's not so cut and dry. So I just wanted to share that sometimes things aren't exactly as they seem. This is a graphic that I found from a plastic surgery website of what we consider photo distributed or where, what are our sun exposed rashes going to show up? So I think this is a really good example. We have women and then men. Um, and so this is where for us looking at thinking about whether something is sun distributed or not, 
this is where um, we will end up seeing these eruptions. But I think there's also a good guideline for where we need to focus our attention on sun protection. Um, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to show you some photos, just some photos of what this, what dermato can look like in different patients. So here you can see the involvement of the cheeks, but you can see that the nasolabial folds, which is right here next to the nose, are spared because those are considered photoprotected, which is kind of interesting. We talk about a heliotrope rash on eyelids, but you can see here it can be very, very subtle. So this patient just has very, very faint appearance of this violaceous color. And then in a darker skinned patient, this can look really different. So just, you know, this is something to keep in mind when we're thinking about dermatomyositis. Of course, scalp is a big place, especially if you have a in your hair part or you have thinning hair. This is something that we can't forget about. And again, you can see the distribution on the sides of the nose. This patient also has acne, but don't don't pay attention to that. And then ears are another place where you can get significant sun exposure and those are not covered with a baseball cap. So that's something to keep in mind. So here, I just wanted to point out that you can see the front middle of the neck is not really exposed, right? It's not really involved, but you can see the upper chest can be involved. And you can see the posterior shoulders can be involved as well. And you just wanted to show you how it looks and different skin tones here and how the inside aspects of the arms and legs are not really involved. But knees can be involved here again. And notice that in this darker skinned patient, it's harder to tell that it's red there. It just mostly looks brown. And so that's something that where we have to be smart to look for that and be aware of it. Again, pink patches on knees, more knees. And then the thighs are is another place we call that the holster sign. And so that's another place to look. You can have spots on your the trunk of your body as well. It's not as common, but it absolutely can happen. And then this is another patient who has some on the trunk. And then of course the hands are really important. We see these Gotron's papules, and then we look at nail folds. So this is all important when you're doing a skin exam on a patient that has, that we suspect has juvenile dermatomyositis. So this is something that your dermatologist will be doing and rheumatologist. This was a patient who came to see me for eczema that wasn't getting better. And I saw those hands and I was like, that does, is not like any eczema I've ever seen. I think those are Gotron's papules. And he actually had juvenile dermatomyositis. So that's how that was caught. And he'd been misdiagnosed as having eczema for many years before that. This is just a textbook photo. And again, here they're very subtle, just little small pink bumps, not dramatic. And then this is a patient with more severe disease. So we're gonna talk about sun protection. And then the, the question is why? Why, how, why is this relevant to dermatomyositis? We know that UV exposure is associated with dermatomyositis getting worse and it causing flares of the skin disease. I looked in the literature to find evidence of muscle worsening with sun exposure and I wasn't able to find it, but we'll, I'm gonna defer that to Dr. Angelis Han. On, when we, when they look at where people, where in the world people have dermatomyositis, it's more common closer to the equator. So that fits with the increased UV exposure. And then actually there were a couple of studies that were really nice where they did photo testing, where they actually, basically they cover the skin and just leave like little spots. And then they put people in a UV box and expose them to sun, to like to UV radiation. And what they found is that people with dermatomyositis are much more sensitive to UV. And then they have flares in any place that is exposed to UV. So that's why it's really important for us to think about this. And when we think about all those photos that we saw, we can think about, well, a lot of these places are photo exposed places. So it makes sense that the sun is playing a role in people's dermatomyositis. So just really briefly, this is not a sci heavily science talk, but what is, what is UV light? So we have this wide spectrum of light. Visible light is our Roy G. Biv that we think about. And then ultraviolet light is light that we cannot see. UVC is the most damaging, but luckily it's blocked by the ozone layer. So we do, do not, that does not come down to us. But UVA and UVB both come down to earth and can cause sun exposed problems. 
UVB is the one that causes burns, B for burns. So a lot of, um, a lot of like tanning booths and things will give you, will do UVA exposure because they don't want people to burn, but they still want you to get that tan. So, uh, you know, I do not support the use of tanning booths in any sort of way, just say, putting that out there. Um, but what's interesting is we think about light. Um, a lot of my patients will say, well, I don't wear sunscreen all year round because I'm not going outside in the winter time, or I'm only walking from my house to my car. Well, the interesting thing is that UVB rays are blocked by glass, but UVA rays are not. So those are still coming through glass. So if you're sitting in your car, if you're sitting by a window, you are still getting that UV exposure. So really we should all be wearing sunscreen year round. Both UVA and UVB cause damage to the basal layer of the skin and they can cause damage essentially they cause cha nuclear changes to the to the cells and they cause they can cause those cells to become cancerous so what we really think about mostly is oh uv damage leads to skin cancer but it can cause a lot of other problems as well but particularly uva because it can cause inflammation in the skin so you can see how the uva rays penetrate deeper into the skin so they can cause the immune system to get activated and jazzed up and mad so that's why we want to block both UVA and UVB radiation. So some questions now that we're going into the summer, like, am I supposed to just make my kid a hermit and not ever let them do anything? Should I just hide them forever um, in a closet? And the answer is no. Like we want, we want our kids to be able to do all the activities, right? We want them to be able to play outside. We want them to swim. We want them to have a good time. We want you to go on family vacations to the beach. So the question is, how can we do this in a smart way that's also safe for our kids? <clears throat> so let's briefly talk about how sunscreens work. So sunscreens essentially, in one of two ways, prevent the UV radiation from getting into the skin. When we're talking about chemical sunscreens, what happens is there's a chemical reaction that happens on the surface of the skin, and that blocks the UV rays. When we're talking about physical blockers, that they literally reflect off. So in this picture on the right, you can see they're sort of like bouncing off. They're reflecting off of the skin. Sunscreens are really confusing. And I'm sure that you all have experienced this because I have experienced this and I'm fairly well-versed in sunscreen and I'm still like, this is a lot. What does What do all of these terms mean? So Broad spectrum is something that you want to look for because that means it has UVA and UVB protection. We want at least an SPF of 30, although I'm going to show you some data that we may want higher SPFs. And then <clears throat> is it water resistant or very water resistant? And that just tells you how, lo how long it will stay on your skin if you're swimming or sweating. I thought this was a cool picture. I took this from Reddit. It's a um, it's a person using a UV light, which is a black light, um, what their skin looks like with sunscreen on versus no sunscreen. So the, the picture on the right shows a very good application of sunscreen, pretty impressive. She only missed a few spots. Um, <clears throat> but you can see from this that the UV light is completely reflecting off. It's not go getting into the skin. And that's what we want our sunscreen to do. I'm sure you all have walked into a drugstore and been overwhelmed by the sunscreen aisle. So I want to try to break down what it is that we're looking for when we're thinking about sunscreen. A couple of basic things. <clears throat> we only actually use about 20 to 50% of the amount of sunscreen that was used in the testing to determine the SPF. So they're telling you the SPF is 30. That's based on a two millimeter thickness of sunscreen applied. I don't know about you, but I don't apply that much sunscreen. Hold on, sorry, I have a tickle. And while we always say SPF 30 is what you need, what they found in this paper is that if you do a higher SPF, you because we use less sunscreen than we're supposed to, it will probably give you better protection. So that might be a reason to use a higher SPF sunscreen. 
So there's some ways to make up for not us not using enough sunscreen. We can, you can apply that. You should apply the sunscreen before sun exposure. So before you even leave the house, you should reapply in one hour. So that I think if you can do those two things, you've got a good solid foundation for your sun protection. And then using a higher SPF may make up for not using as thick of a layer as we are advised to use. So I wanted to break down chemical versus physical sunblocks because I think this is also very confusing. I'm going to hopefully simplify it for you. These are all of the chemical sunblocks that you can find. So it's pretty broad spectrum of, um, of sun of sunscreens that are available. And we don't even have all of the, the sunscreens available that they have in Europe. A lot of these are um, can be toxic to coral reefs. So you may have heard about that. And these are these are all sunscreens that cause that chemical reaction to happen. Most of them require at least two or three of these ingredients in order to have that broad spectrum. So most sunscreens are good at blocking UVB, but what we want is to also block UVA. And for that, you usually have to have an additional product in there or ingredient. Physical blockers are a lot easier. Zinc oxide, what's in diaper cream, titanium dioxide, also like a white material. And then iron oxide is actually brown. It, is, it only blocks visible light. So that's a caveat, but it's a nice ingredient because it can be added to our, sorry about that. It can be added to make them more appropriate for people with skin of color. It makes them browner. So some pros and cons, um, pros of chemical sunscreens, they are virtually transparent. So they just blend right into your skin. So in that regard, they're good for skin of all color um, and they're cosmetically often much more elegant. They're available in lotions, sticks and sprays. They are, some of the drawbacks, they're not all reef safe. If they get in your eyes, they can burn. And which I'm sure everybody on this call has experienced at least once getting sunscreen in your eye. And if you get sunscreen in your kid's eye, heaven forbid, like they'll never forgive you. At least that's the case in my house. And they may, and they may cause allergies or sensitivities. So there are people that are allergic to ingredients such as octocrylene, octanoxate, um, avobenzone, benzophenone is a very well-known contact allergen. Physical blockers, on the other hand, are a lot less irritating. So they're better for people with very sensitive skin, people with eczema, that kind of thing. They are available in lotion and stick. You can find a spray occasionally. Trader Joe's sometimes has a zinc oxide spray, but it is hard to, harder to find. The cons are that they can be really chalky and they can look ashy on darker skin tones. They, the older ones actually make me look like a Smurf and my husband laughs at me. Physical blockers, <clears throat> though, have another plus of them is that they have better protection across the UV, UV spectrum. So you can see here, this is basically how much light UV light can get through is what th this graph is showing. So on the bottom, you can see that very little UV light of both UVB and UVA gets through for titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. Now, these are very, very high high percentages of titanium and zinc. And we're going to be looking at much lower percentages in our pro commercial products. But you can see how things like avobenzone are pretty good at UVB and they're pretty good at the really high UVAs, but they're not so good in the middle. So that's why they're combined with something else. So you can see like they put the two different ingredients together. There's a, been a lot of controversy about whether sunscreens are safe or not. Um, sun, uh, sunscreens are safe. They're, to me, there's no controversy. Sunscreens are very safe. Um, even the nanoparticles, which is like the smallest version of the zinc and titanium are not absor absorbed through the skin. They're not small enough to get into the skin. Nano zinc and nano titanium dioxide are much more cosmetically elegant on the skin. They don't make you look like, you know, you remember the lifeguards used to have that blue, I can't remember what it was called, um, the stripe on the nose. These are much more cosmetically elegant. So they blend in better. And so they can be used on a daily basis. 
<clears throat> so you're probably wondering, well, that was not very helpful because you haven't given us any examples. But here are some examples of sunscreens that are that I recommend for gentle skin, so or delicate skin, like people with eczema. Um, labels, generally speaking, labels that say sensitive or baby are usually physical blockers, but you're going to want to check the label to make sure that that is the case. And then stick sunscreens are one of my favorite things in my arsenal. We love them in my house because my kids can draw it on themselves, which they really enjoy. And then I can rub it in for them. They're a little bit waxier, so they're easier to apply and there's less likelihood of them like getting into their eyes and making them mad but definitely rub them in. This is not one of those where you can just like leave them unattended. Um, you do have to make sure you rub them in or you will get streaks. So skin of color is a whole nother situation. This is something I'm particularly interested in. And we know that autoimmune conditions can disproportionately affect people with skin of color. So this is particularly important in our autoimmune community. What it sounds an awful lot like I prefer mineral sunscreens, which is true. I do much prefer mineral sunscreens, but what if they look like ashy and white on your skin? Nobody's going to want to use that. So nowadays there are actually much more products out there that are more cosmetically elegant. They blend into the skin. They don't leave an ashy white cast. And so I, these are ones that I recommend for my patients with skin of color they, so some of them are chemical blockers. So the, the Trader Joe's sunscreen, the super goop sunscreen, those are chemical blockers. The rest are physical blockers, but they are tinted. So they will, you know, they like are brown. Um, I'm really, really into this Neutrogena UV mineral, mineral UV tint right now. It's I'm the medium deep color, but it comes in a deep color that is great for even our darker skin toned patients. And it is a very nice product to use. I do not get paid by any of these companies for the record. So I'm not making any money off of these, unfortunately. <laughs> so I recommend physical blockers that have greater than or equal to 20% zinc or greater than 5% titanium dioxide. And then those might include iron oxide on for the darker skin tones. So you might just see that on the labels. What about sunscreen sprays? So sunscreen sprays have become much more popular over time. And here you can see that they're, the sprays are going up and lotions are coming down. My husband insists that he will only use sunscreen if it's a spray. So, you know, you can't win every battle. Um, my thoughts on this, there's no safety data about inhalation of these sunscreen ingredients yet. But this is my concern is that we are inhaling quite a bit of, of materials that are not meant to be inhaled. So that is why I don't generally recommend these except in specific circumstances. They're also highly flammable. So you do have to warn patients that, um, or you have to be warned that doing it near a barbecue, a fire pit, um, not safe. And there have been reports of those catching on fire. I really do the, I, the one situation where I like these is in putting it in your part, because I think it's really hard to get sunscreen in your part. And I think the clear sprays are a lot easier and we all have experienced some sort of a burn in the part because you don't really think about that. And it's really hard to get sunscreen in there. The other thing I, I like to use them for is for reapplication. So for a second or third application, I think that they can be helpful but you really have to rub them in because people will get burns in streaks where the sunscreen spray didn't hit. So sun protective clothing is, is great. And it, I'm going to show you some evidence for why we want to do sun protective clothes. They UP, UPF 50. So we, you know, we talk about SPF, which is solar protection factor. UPF is UV protection factor. Um, but it's a, say, a similar measure for, for our purposes. It's more readily available now. And so that's really helpful. It's not one of these things that's like a niche product you have to order from one to a specific place anymore. So it's much easier to get. And then my other caveat with hats. So I love hats. I like broad brimmed hats if possible to look you know as elegant as possible but that way you're covering your ears and the back of your neck which is where 
older people will get skin cancers. Hats alone do not protect from reflected light, right? So there's light reflecting off of concrete, off of water if you're on a boat. So you still have to use sunscreen on your skin. Sun protective clothing is better at protecting against the broad range of UV than sunscreens in a head-to-head -head comparison. So this is actually from that same paper. And you can see again, the transmittance on the left is how much UV is getting through onto the skin. And then the bottom is the wavelength spectrum UVA to UVB or UVB to A. And you can see that very little UV is getting through in these sun protective clothes. Whereas at different SPF levels, it is, um, it is less and less, or sorry, more and more UV is getting through. Sorry, I said that really confusingly. This was a, a paper um, from, a, from derm a dermatology group. And they, this just showed that there's so many more items of clothing that are listed by various retailers that sell clothes. So it's getting more available. So where do you buy, where do you buy these things? Um, if you just type in UPF 50 clothing in Amazon, you're going to see a lot of different things, but it can be a little overwhelming. There's a lot of different companies and you don't always know how they were made. And this is not a very well-regulated area. So I rely on the Skin Cancer Foundation. They have a, a nice approval process. So these are the Skin Cancer Foundation approved brands that you can shop and you all will have access to these slides. Other tips when you're shopping, look for that UPF 50 label, wide brims on hats, um, or even like visors, anything that sort of is comfortable and easy to use that you will actually use on a regular basis is good. So tight woven knits are best, which kind of makes sense because if it's very tight, you're not going to let as much UV through. But interestingly, looser fitting, fitting clothes, clothing is better at protecting your skin from UV. And the other th interesting thing that I learned um, do, making this talk is washing your clothes before using what laundered clothing has better UV protection. So, so go figure. So wash those Amazon clothes before you wear them. So sunglasses are another thing that we don't always think about as part of our sun protection regimen, but <clears throat> Eyelids and the inner eyelid, eyelids and the inner eyelid in particular. So right here, this is called the medial canthus in particular are missed when you do sunscreen application, which kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's kind of hard to get the sunscreen in there and you don't want to get it in your eye. This was a study that looked at <clears throat> people's sunscreen application and they looked at a lot of people, I think like a hundred, 150 people. And they looked at where did they miss sunscreen and those are the places that were missed the most. But sun exposure to the eyes has a lot of other side effects too. It can cause discoloration of the whites of your eyes um, and this pterygium, which is like a, it's overgrowth of the mucosa that goes onto your, onto your, what the white of your eye, but it can even cross onto your iris or the part that is colored. Um, and that requires surgery to treat. Um, but it can also cause cataracts and it can cause, and if the light gets back to the retina, it also can cause sun damage to, to your retina, which is in the back of your eye. Another interesting thing that I learned is that in children, a, they get way more exposure of UV into the back of the eye than adults do. And I'm not really sure why that is, but up to age eight or 10, they have a much higher absorption of light to the back of the eye. So this, and the, that age group is the hardest to get to wear sunglasses, at least in my experience with my own children. So, um, but it is especially important in that, in that age group. So what about supplements? There is a supplement called HelioCare, which again, I do not get paid by these people, um, that this is a, an it's an extract from a plant in, from South America that tribes used to use to help 
protect their skin from sun damage. And what they found is that this does really work. Anecdotally, I use this for my very, very, very pale husband. I make him take it when we go on vacation. Um, the drawbacks are there's not yet any evidence in dermatomyositis or lupus in adults or children, but it is proposed as something that we should be testing. And there's no data in children for dosing, but I will tell you it comes in capsules and you can open the capsule and a lot of parents will do half of one of those capsules and mix it with juice and give it to their children. In terms of side effect profile, this is a very safe medication. Um, you give it once a day in the morning before the sun exposure happens. So we always do it when we're on vacation in a very sunny place. The other supplementation that I think is worth mentioning, if you're doing a really, really great job of protecting against sun, you are all you are also at risk of vitamin D deficiency. So supplementing with vitamin D can, may be helpful. So this is one where you're going to want to talk to your doctor about testing your vitamin D level and supplementing with that if it is needed. My personal tips, I saw a lot of skin cancers and sunburns in many age groups before I became a pediatric dermatologist. So ears and backs of necks are places that people always miss. So don't miss those. Use sticks on, on kids' faces. Apply your sunscreen before your sun exposure and one hour after, and that's going to get you pretty close to that ideal amount of sunscreen. You have to reapply every hour if, you're, if kids are swimming or if they're sweating a lot. So set a timer. I have to do that myself too, because time goes by really fast when you're at the pool or at the beach. Um, avoid sprays in general, but they can be good for your hair part or they can be good for reapplication. And aim for 20% or, or higher zinc oxide or more than 5% titanium dioxide sunscreens. So to summarize, we review Im images of patients that have juvenile dermatomyositis. We, um, and we know that it can look very different based on the skin tone. And so it's, it's just helpful for all of us to know that that's the case. Choose a sunscreen that has zinc oxide, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide if possible. And it may mean some trial and error to find one that you like using or that feels comfortable or that your kid will tolerate putting on. Use hats and sun protective clothing and wear your sunglasses. That's probably good advice for all of us, grownups and kids. So that concludes my presentation. Amazing. Well, we have a couple of questions if we could put you both on the spot. Sure. Um, one question that comes up a lot, Ryan, let me know if, if it's okay if we jump in. Um, we have a mom asking about sprays. So I think we all understand it's not ideal, but sometimes, like you said, something is better than nothing. Yeah. Um, how, when you've got a wiggly toddler, how are we holding the spray on for a long enough time? Do you think um, I've, I've seen people at the beach spraying in the air and walking through, which that certainly cannot possibly be working. <laughs> That's so good what for are, what are application. On, yeah. How to actually get a spray on a toddler who probably doesn't want to be doing any of this. Do you have yeah, to it's, hold it toddlers are tough. It's tough. Yeah. So here's what I do with my own children. If we have a spray involved, um, I do a stripe down the front of their leg, a stripe down the back of their leg. Same for the arms. I just like do big stripes and I take, keep it about, I would say like three to four inches from their skin. So pretty close. So you have like a pretty, like a nice stripe that you can see. And then I take that and rub it in. Um, I do not ever spray on the face, obviously. Um, I spray into hands. If I'm going to use spray on the on for the face, I spray onto hands and then apply it. Um, and then I would just do stripes. So like on the back, you might want to do three stripes. Um, same for the chest. So that way you're you make sure that you're getting enough on there, and it needs to be fit, held fairly close to the skin. Make sure that it gets on there. So one other question, this one might be actually for Dr. Anjali's home that came in. Um, so I'll let you guys tag team maybe. 
Um, if the UV is zero and you're outside in what you might consider a reasonably shaded spot, can JDMers go outside without sunblock in a no UV situation? Or is this sort of a always better safe than sorry? Well, from my perspective, there is no zero UV situation. If there, if the sun is out, there is UV. What wavelengths there are and how strong the sun is, is another thing. So the highest UV radiation is between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So if it's outside of those times, you have much lower wavelengths of UV that are coming through, much less UV is coming through. Um, I would say that though, I think sunscreen should be a daily part of life for people with a okay. sun sensitive condition. So I would think of this as medicine. This is a medicine. So it goes on so every think, day, no matter what. So Marco's question, I think the answer is if you're outside um, there and, you know, especially between those hours, but there's not really a no UV situation. I've heard of families that only use sunblock when it's four or higher or only use sunblock between 10 and two. And it sounds like that's probably not ideal and potentially even dangerous from a, a flaring perspective. From a flaring perspective, there is really good data that dermatomyositis flares when exposed to UV. Also, this is also true of lupus. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, yes, this is one of these, your mileage may vary. Some people are more sun sensitive than others. And that's true whether you have dermatomyositis or not. So I think though, finding a sunscreen and if it's going to be your daily sunscreen, I think an SPF 30 is usually a lot easier to use and putting that on just exposed skin. So face, neck, ears, um, back of the neck, if you have short hair, um, and then arms, I think, and, and backs of hands. I think that that should just be like a basic thing that happens every day, which is really hard. I know it's really hard. I have two kids and it is really hard to get them to do really anything on a daily so, basis. So and, I get And I don't know if this one is also for Dr. Anjali Khan, because it's more of a JDM specific question, but um, what would be your advice for kiddos at school who we th parents think they may be getting UV from school lights or that kind of thing? Do you typically advise um, JDMers to have filters put into school lights? Do you advise them to wear sunblock at school? What's your typical advice? In, in general, I, yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Maradi, and I advise all my patients, you know, whether it's juvenile or lupus, to it's like lotion. You put it on in the morning, and it's just something you do, you know, every day. I don't necessarily talk about, you know, filters or you know, caps. Sometimes um, some families will wonder whether or not their children should wear caps at school. But I think once you start with a sunblock and you make it just part of the daily routine, I think that can help overall. Uh, Dr. Mari, I'm not sure if you advise differently with hats or, or sunglasses in school. I do. And I have actually, I write a lot of notes for teachers to apply sunscreen before recess. Um, so because a lot of okay. schools are requiring that now. And so I'm always happy to write those notes for patients. We, okay. And, a couple um, that came through in the chat. Oh, go ahead, Brian. And, yeah. um, there was one that came through during the presentation on um, what you're able to wash into your clothing in the laundry. Does the product you can wash into <laughs> your clothes work as UPF protection? It's called Right Sun Guard. Are you yeah, yeah, I am. I am familiar with it. The problem is that we don't know exactly how much is getting into your clothes. Now, that being said, I think that that is a great additional thing to do. Um, and we do know that clothing in general general, especially if it's a tight knit, particularly things like nylon, um, or rayon, any of these art artificial um, types of materials are particular are better at UV protection. Um, so you're getting some UV protection from your clothing. Yes. I think that that's a great thing to add on to clothes that are not already UV protective. But I, the problem is that I, we can't quantify how good the protection is, right? It's no, there's no way to say, oh, it's a UPF of 30 or a UPF of 50. 
um, because we don't know exactly, how, like it's all gonna depend on the types of fibers, what dyes were used, what your washing machine does, you know? So there's a lot of variables there. So I would say don't rely only on that, but I think it can be a helpful additional thing to have on hand. Okay, great. And then a couple more in the what chat. Um, even though sun protection is essential for everyone, can kids who are in remission still have same risk levels as kids who have active disease? Do risk de decrease over time? I don't know if there's ever, I don't know if there have been particular studies, you know, on that, but I think in general, if we know that there is a particular trigger for flaring, I think even for a child in remissions, that there are um, risks for flare over time, it probably is a good idea to continue using the sunblock. Um, I also tell family, even without autoimmune disease, I think everyone should use sunblock, as Dr. Maradi said, so I would continue doing that um, regardless of the risk decreasing over time. Great, great, thank you. And then should they avoid going outside even with sunscreen when the UV is high during the hours of 10 to 4? I, I mean, I think if you have the option of like hosting a pool party at, you know, at noon versus hosting it at like 3 or 4 p.m., I would say do it later if you can. But the thing is, like, I don't want to be overly restrictive you know, we still want people to live their lives, right? It's it's not reasonable to tell people like, no, you just can't go outside during these hours. That's not cool. So I think we just have to be extra cautious during those times and be aware that when those, like during those hours of the day, it's a higher UV index. So you do have to do more, you know, additional protective measures. All right, absolutely. Uh uh, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, we have had, one more when you're this done. This is this is one from from me personally. So um, <laughs> it's summertime, and this is tips and tricks for summer. The days are getting long. I live in the state of Florida, so the UV is pretty intense. Um, you know, ten to four. I mean, the sun seems pretty intense at five, six p.m. here right now. Is it <clears throat> because it's summertime? Is it more intense at say six p.m. right now than it is in the winter? Yes. Short answer, yes. Okay, so so <laughs> extra precautions in the summer, you know, in those long days. Yes, the UV index is just the highest in the middle of the day, but that yeah. is not to say like, depending on where you are in relation to the equator, you are going to have a higher UV index um, in places like beautiful, sunny Florida. Perfect. Um, one more that came in by text to Dr. Moradi. Um, are is it possible for you to back up to those photos of the sunscreen so people can yeah. take pictures with their phone? Sure. Um, because I think we all um, struggle with finding just that right one that your kid likes. So we'd like to try a lot of them. Yeah. I forgot that I didn't have my screen shared again. So let me do that real quick. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. How can I be and, this incompetent with technology at this stage? <laughs> one more that came in, Ryan, from someone that wasn't able to join. I don't know if it's kind of already been addressed, but um, do you feel like it's true when they say that sometimes cloud cloudy weather is worse because the UV is bouncing around? Or is that something that isn't actually a I don't know about the UV bouncing, but I will tell you, I think cloudy weather is worse because people get a false sense of security. Um, like I said in the chat, 70% of UV rays come through on a cloudy day. So it seems like you're fine, but you're actually not really fine. And so we tend to, and myself included, right? We all do this. We all think like, oh, okay, do I need to do a full, do I need to coat my kid like a hundred percent in zinc oxide right now? Um, we're going to the pool at like 5 PM. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, or it's cloudy outside. So is it really that big of a deal? But objectively you're still getting, it's just like that um, sitting by glass you're sitting in a car, you're getting UV radiation um, and UV rays still come through the clouds. So unfortunately, it's that UVA that's getting through. And that's the one that you don't notice because UVB is the one that gives you that, it can, it gives you a burn, but you don't always get a burn from UVA, but it's still causing damage. So that's, I think the important takeaway. 
Great, thank you. <clears throat> and then this uh, is the looks like we may have a couple lines. more still coming through the chat. Um, this was, I think you touched on this one and I was curious about this as well, um, maybe for Dr. Angelis Han as well. Does sun affect more skin or muscle involvement? Can someone have muscle only inflammation caused by sun without a rash? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And, and I agree with Dr. Murad, he, you know, most of the studies talk more about um, the skin or the rashes flaring with sun exposure and, and less so with the muscle disease. But I'd say for other um, autoimmune diseases like lupus, the sun can trigger the condition to flare regardless of having the rash itself. So I'd say for JM, it seems more triggering of rash and not as much of muscle disease. But in other autoimmune conditions, we do see it happening in, in, in not just the rash itself, but more of the systemic types of symptoms too. Uh, so it, it's tough. I don't think there's a lot of literature out there for systemic symptoms or muscle disease for JM um, particularly. Do you think there is a pot potential study on the horizon that would address that? I think that's a good thing to look at um, as well. Or we, we can also ask, I, I think even just, you know, in, in clinics, just asking our families if they're noticing, mm -hmm. you know, families themselves, do you notice that when your child is exposed to sun is the muscle weakness or the muscle involvement worsening compared to the rash? I mean, that's one thing we can think about too. Well, we certainly get more um, new families joining us every September, October, and mm -hmm. November because you would you would think that was related to the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually scoured PubMed to look for yeah. articles that correlated UV exposure to the actual muscle enzymes and muscle involvement. And I couldn't find any studies. So I just think it hasn't been studied yet. I'm with Dr. Anjali's Han on this. Well, well thank you. Um, and then this is one that I think <laughs> continues to be brought up. Um, so I, I think we can, can be short on it. but. Um, if your child wants to sit outside without, you know, sunscreen and the precautions, um, you know, is it safe in the shade? It, it seems like the consensus on these questions is regardless of if it's cloudy or you're in the shade, you should be wearing sunscreen at all times and get in the habit of putting it on almost like makeup on a daily basis, correct? Yeah, there's still some reflected light no matter what, even if you're in the shade. Um, so, and this is, your mileage may vary, right? Some people are going to respond. They're going to get a sunburn in the shade. My husband is one of those examples, although he swears mm -hmm. up and down that he can tan, but I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so that, so, but I, I think that it should just become a daily part of life. Like I wake up, I brush my teeth and I put my layer of sunscreen on. And a quick follow up on that, you know, we uh, in our our household have spun it as a positive for the rest of us to wear sunscreen the way that we should, you know, including the sibling, um, you know, just it's a reason for everyone in the house to join, you know, the, the patient with JDM um, in this and, and we all should be doing it anyway. So I think that's been kind of helpful um, to see that he's not alone in it. I think that's a great point. You know, I think that family, like that collaborative spirit. I think that's really, really helpful because the last thing that you want to do when you have, when you're a child with a rare condition is to feel even more singled out. So I think that that's a great point, Ryan. Good. And then should JDM patients see a dermatologist too? It sounds like, again, Cincinnati is, is kind of the, the best practice, you know, the model of what, you know, we wish we had everywhere. Um, should you have a, a pediatric dermatologist with JDM? You know, I think it's very, if you have access to a pediatric dermatologist, I think it's very reasonable, much like pediatric rheumatologists, there's not a lot of us, but dermatologist, there's a lot of dermatologists that also take care of kids. So if you have access to a pediatric derm in particular, I would, I think it's reasonable to get established care with them because that way, <clears throat> once you're an established patient, it's just so much easier for you to get anything done with them. So if you get, if you have a flare, if you, you know, something comes up, then you're not like scrambling, trying to find someone to, to take care of you. Um, and a lot of places like we have my chart. And so I tell parents get on my chart and you don't need to see me for a year, or you don't even need to come back and see me. But now that you're established, 
and we've seen you, you can message me and send me photos like, and I can help troubleshoot some things or figure out if you need to come see me and then I can get you an appointment. It just makes things a lot easier. So if you can establish a relationship with someone, I do think that that is helpful. I agree as well. And I found that, you know, a lot of our patients who both Dr. Murati and I see together, I can easily ask you, I saw this patient and I'm not sure I can't get this rash better. You know, what do you think? Here's a photo. I think that collaborative care is so critical um, for good outcomes. We work together quite a lot for a lot of these patients. Great. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, what we aspire for um, across the the spectrum with CureJM. and projects like our clinical care network is to provide more of that 360 degree care for the future. Um, Maybe in the past folks have only, you know, had one type of doctor or a pediatric rheumatologist. And I think more and more we'll see a model in which we go to that holistic, you know, 360 degree approach. So that's very exciting. Well, Um, I am, I opened the breakout rooms, Ryan, if you're ready, but you let us know because um. I, I talk for too long. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, no, we're, no. we're getting I really wonder, good questions too. I will put um I will put my email in the chat for future questions. We will get them all answered by um the wonderful Dr. Moradi and Dr. Anjali's Han um for any future questions. But I think we I mean we answered quite a few, I think. <laughs> Some of the big ones, right? We did, and it, it is awesome to see them continue to come in. So as you mentioned, Shannon, um We will collect these in in the chat and reach out personally um, to any that we were unable to address, um, especially the ones that are kind of case by case and very specific. Um, At this time, let's, uh, we still have a great group on here. Let's go ahead and and break out into into rooms um, for those who would like to to stay on. Um, Really quickly before we let Dr. Maradi and Dr. Angelis Han go, thank you so much for your time and your insight on this important topic, especially going into the the summer season. And um, again, just reminders for the entire household, I think, you know, not just something for our JDM patients, but for the in, entire house to, to bond over. Um, and like Shannon mentioned, it's, it's a topic that's near and dear, and it's one that we all have probably an uphill battle, um, especially with our teens and our younger kids. So thank you again. We will uh, have the recording and presentation available. Um, probably sometime next week. So we'll keep everyone posted on that as well. Um, Again, reminder on the walk, uh, really excited about the progress for everyone walking across the country and raising funds for our children and and patients with this uh, disease. So may we continue to take those important steps towards better treatment.